Climate elements in it, so there's going to be some gloom and doom, but there will be a glittery, shiny thing in the end as well. A few. Um, most climate talks tell you how terrible the situation is. During this 50-minute talk, five species around the world are going extinct. I think that's terrible. Um, and the, the, the links are there. You can follow those. There's generally links, footnotes, and there's more references in the in the download. Um, if I think about species going extinct, I think, which, is the, which are the ones that we depend on? Because we do depend on each other in this earth, as humans as well as animals. I don't believe politicians are going to show this, and having heard a few climate talks during this, this, uh, this series of lectures, <laughs> I don't think anyone else agrees that they would have vision, knowledge, or spine needed to do this. Consumers seem to be waiting for a drop-in instant replacement that solves all their problems in one buy, because that's simple and easy and no overlap and cheap, and, and maybe making things worse. Technology is always promising, yeah, this is nice, this can solve it, but see, this is going to be the cheaper one. We'll have it in 10 years, but we are here now, we need it now. And I'm really worried about how these things are working. Um, Usually when species go extinct, um, including humans, by the way, it's due to resource shortage. Um, something in the habitat changes, some food form falls, falls away, and they die, they perish. By the way, if this happens to human societies, then usually the response is that the humans cannibalize on their leaders who have failed. Um, we can't stress that often enough towards our politicians, I think. Um, but. Um, Jared Diamond has done a lot of research on how uh, societies collapse, and the link is a very good uh, short video. I really recommend it. He compares it like to uh, bacteria in a petri dish. I mean, it's full of food, and it's just munching, 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 and all of a sudden it hits the rim. And of course, it looks one molecule ahead. So, only when it hits the rim, it realizes I now need to die because there's no food for me left anymore, and that happens to the entire culture at once. While they were munching, 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 they never saw it, but the, the inevitable problem was coming, it was hitting them. And in humans, the same seems to be happening, uh, also according to the research by Jared Diamond. And it is not because people are stupid, it's because they make local and individual choices. I understand the problem, but I really need this now. And uh, sometimes we make excuses, sometimes it's really true for survival, for example. But Take, t taking back to politics, if we look at the number of humans and uh, multiply by the average resource dependency of a human, we are using 1.75 Earth. There is, uh, uh, you can compute back, uh, if you take the resource for a full year and start on January 1st, what's the day at which the resource has been used? In this case, it's next Thursday. So we're halfway of the year, roughly, and we've used up all the resources that we have available for this year. How can this be sustainable? Are we not going to consume any more for the rest of the year? I don't think so. So we should be clever about this. Um, Mahatma Gandhi said it better than I can. I would say be part of the solution or the problem, but I also very much love be the change you wish to see in the world. Well, there might be few people here that agree. Um, hack your way into... so. What I tend to do is hack my way into physics, even biochemistry. I didn't have much chemistry at school. Um, energy, but also the microbes are part of that. I mean, they sort of go together with biochemistry, and they have their own classification of resources. And what I always try to do is not depend on global solutions, the big ones, the big schemes, because they tend to be corporal and have completely different interests. So I try to make local, find local solutions and gain control, personal control if possible. So, with that, let's talk a bit more about microbes. Anyone here brewed beer? Yeah. Beer, yeah. Not drinking, brewing. <laughs> Anyone here um, um, made sauerkraut? Kimchi. Kimchi, yeah, that's sauerkraut with additional red peppers, but it's basically the same recipe. Sauerkraut is normally made with white cabbage, but uh, you can pretty much use any vegetable and just put it in the salt water and it'll ferment. 
I'll explain why later. Um, v vinegar is pr usually uh, something that went wrong with your wine, and I'll explain how that forms too. Um, but let's go for four, four uh, candidates. Amylase actually is not a microbe, it's, uh, it's an enzyme, so it takes a module and puts it together in another way, or splits it or something. And what amylase does is takes starch, so a chain of glucose molecules, adds water and then forms glucose, a, a lot of different glucose molecules. And glucose is the food for all of life. So that's why it stores in long chains, because then it's not accessible to the others, and uh, only to those who have amylase. Where do you find it? Well, in our, um, in our uh, saliva, for example, in our small intestines, we produce it so that we can do that too. Um, the plants also need it, so it's usually like if you have the seed from which you brew the beer, you usually, um, um, it, it also needs to take down its own starches, so it actually uh, has amylase on board, which is activated when there's water, so that the glucose gets, is made available. So usually what you do with brewing beer is you start growing the seeds a little until the maximum amount of sugar is available, you can see that at length, and then you cut short the life of the seed. Um, and amylase can also be produced by microbes and by chemical plants, and there's plenty of places to get it from. Yeast um, is a microbe, it's a single cell thing, and it takes a sugar and turns to CO2 and alcohol. So these are the bubbles and these are the buzz in your beer. Um, so we got that already, and there's hope for uh, maintainability or other things. Now, um, if you produce a beer, you usually take a yeast and you inoculate the beer with so much yeast that no other species basically has a chance. And that's usually how it works. If something is really persistent, really everywhere, it's going to take over everything. A bit like humans are doing with Earth, perhaps. But if you make a lambic beer, you do it completely differently. You do not ino inoculate it with an explicit species, which you could say is a very technical approach, a very controlled approach. Um, lambic is more the natural way of saying just we take shallow pan, we put our, our sugar water, uh, basically you take these seeds, you boil them out, so the sugar comes out, you sift out the, the seeds and you have sugary water. They put that in a hollow pan, open the windows overnight and let the wind gust over it, go over it, and then you get yeast from nature, which can be varieties. It's in the air everywhere anyway. Um, but you may also get lactobacilli and acetobacter, and these are different breeds. Lactobacilli transforms lactose, but also leaves other sugars into lactic acid. This is what makes yogurt sour. And acetobacter are slightly different. They take an alcohol, and they turn it into acetic acid. And acetic acid is what makes vinegar acidic. And we will see this come back, actually, because um, we also produce something called acetate, and we actually use it for energy. Um, but basically, the process for beer is then amylase and yeast, and if it's lambic, one or two of these might also help to get a more acidic beer, and that's indeed what a lambic is. Um, and of course, if acetobacter will end up in your wine, it is also going to turn to vinegar. We also know that effect. So get, keep your fruit flies away, because they carry them on their little paws. Because they go from rotting fruit to rotting fruit to rotting fruit. Um, in general, microbes form collaborative communities. They have resources that they pass from one to the other, and basically they're munching away at each other's excrements. Um, but even a single cell, like a yeast, is extremely, comp extremely clever. Um, it, takes gluco it takes sugar apart and puts it out in two ways, but different sugars need different enzymes to take apart. I mean, it's just a different sort of, machi of machine that needs done. Now, these enzymes are produced by transcribing bits of DNA. And what you can do, and that's called epigenetics, it also works for humans, is put a clamp on the part that would otherwise get transcribed. And by that, you can basically control, switch on or off uh, a transition. And it uses that because glucose offers it more energy. So when there's glucose, it will gladly turn that into CO2 and alcohol. But when there's another sugar, which is... Uh, when there are only other sugars, it will use those because it will help it survive, even though it's at a lower energy state. 
So what, what it does to, to achieve that is that, um, and to avoid spending resources for those other enzymes every time, is it puts this clamp on it when, whenever there's glucose available. When the glucose drops, it goes away. So yeast can actually be hungry and start nibbling on wood or something. Um, why does it do this? Because it gives it the best chance of, of survival. Eat the most energetic food when available, if not do what we need for survival. And that's another aspect of microbes, they compete. Um, if they want the same resource, they are going to compete for it. Um, and an example will be the alcohol that should, I, alcohol, sorry, the lactose, that could be taken up by the yeast or by the lactobacilli. So lambic generally has both alcohol and acidity because both communities evolve. If you were to splash in an incredible amount of lactobacilli, I don't think there will be much alcohol. It would definitely influence ratios. So this is sort of how this mucky brew comes together by a, co a combination of, um, of microbes. And I think it's really is exciting. Especially comparing technology to nature, I think, is really interesting. I love technology. I mean, it's simple, it's clean, it's abstract, it's got this beautiful mathematical underpinning very often. But maybe a downside, it is a single uh, solution thingy. And everything we do must be enforced by energy. Whereas, in nature, everything is complex, and they just take all the possible solutions you ever found and throw it at there. I mean, everywhere around us are microbes, but what survives on this pole is different because, well, I just touched it, it's a bit fatty now, so quite likely that fat specialized microbes are going to form a film on there. Whereas in your nostril, there's another specification, uh, specialization, uh, then in your ears and the, on your skin, and they're everywhere, and they're useful, and we want them around. Hygiene, st sorry, sterility is a stupid way of achieving hygiene. Washing your hands with soap is good enough. Antibacterial soap is stupid, because you are killing all the species. And probably giving way to the strongest one to survive. We're creating a new, well, I'll get to that. Um, but the interesting thing is that because of this throwing every solution at every problem, it's, nature always comes with all-purpose solutions, and whatever happens is voluntary, because there's energy to be had. So those microbes really like to work on there, and when they're successful, they will, they will grow and get more, more dominant. Now, I'm not saying technology and nature are opponents. I think they, they are best when they're brought together. And that's why I'm giving this talk. Um, permaculture is an area of expertise that tends to do this with plants and technology, like solar cells and heating your, your greenhouse and that sort of thing. Um, I'm taking a bit of a special angle by saying, well, let's see what we can do with microbes. That's a bit of an experiment. I might go mad, but or you might call me mad. It's not quite the same thing. So when I was born, I got a symbiote implanted. That's pretty unique. Nobody else has a symbiote. But it's really helping me. It's doing this epigenetic thing for me. And that means I have less risk of cancer, of heart disease, and diabetes. It trains and it calms my immune system. I've been very happy about that last few years. And um, I think that's generally very pleasant to have. But it is a symbiote. If I uh, don't care for it properly, it will hit back on me. Um, you probably guessed what I'm talking about. I mean, this is a picture of one such symbiote. This will be the symbiote. Um, all these little critters and creatures here, all the bacteria and viruses and whatever else you have. Um, this is a slime layer, and these are body cells. And these are the internal, these are the cells of the, uh, the wall lining of your large intestine, so this one. The one that's filled with the dirtiest thing you can think of, that your mother always said is dirty, but it's actually extremely useful and it does a lot. It counts. Ten t these microbes together have 10 times the number of cells that your body has. Their DNA is 150-fold of what we have. Imagine what food you can munch on with that. And it's giving that away, sometimes to other microbes, sometimes to us. And that's where I mentioned acetate. One of the things they produce is acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Those are the so-called short-chain fatty acids. And they do marvels for us. They uh, are burnt as energy, first and foremost, to make our uh, lining produce more slime and be more resilient to, uh, to, to all sorts of things, uh, close off better. Uh, they do lots of things, but also they get in the bloodstream. They tell the trigger to, to do different things. 
um, and they, they, they will even improve your fat burning, for example. Butyrate improves your fat burning. That's why people who eat oats are usually very slim, but because oats tends to produce a lot of butyrate. And that basically signals to the, the, the epigenetic uh, game is started to trigger the, 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 the body towards digesting uh, fat instead of other things. Um, the condition is that I need to feed it real food. I can get into a definition, but you know, real food, proper food, whole food, pretty much you know what I mean. I'm not talking about McDonald's here. So, um, I was really surprised to find that statistical clustering research found that there are two clusters of these things. I compare them to mafia families, headed by the one boss is called Bacteroids and the other boss is called Prevotella. I don't care about the names. But they have vastly different properties. One of them um, feasts on cl cholesterol, saturated fats, so in other words, meat, fish, dairy, and egg. And as we know, these are pretty detrimental for our health, especially in the long term. Um, whereas Prevotella is onto fiber and phytophenols, as you can see from this, it's from plants. So basically, vegetables, fruits, grains, and pulses, and that's constructive for our health. There is an incredible body of uh, nutrition research that so consequently says that this style of food gives people prosperity, um, um, health, uh, lo longevity, 14 years extra to their lives, and in those lives more, sorry, in those years more life, so more years in your life and more life in your years, good deal. Whereas this happens to make us and die. Um, I think, and but, but now I'm interpreting, I think, um, first of all, this is part of a larger chain, of, of course, this is just one instrument. But I think um, um, this is mostly the time-tested DNA code. We've been debugging this system for ages. Many people have died out because they ate badly, or had the, gene, sorry, had the genes that didn't adapt to the way they had to eat, nam namely vegetable-based, the farmers and such. Whereas this is more for occasional partying. And if we screw up something in our body, the body will heal. So there's no natural selection on that. I mean, the body's incredibly good at healing, especially if you switch back to that later. Doing this three times a day might hit upon a few untested code lines on your DNA. And that's, uh, I, I, I think the diabetes and the heart disease and the, the cancer, which are greatly on the rise, they are very much linked to this style of living. And the interesting thing is, you are not stuck with the microbes that you're born with, because when you feed them differently, their proportions change. Just like I explained for uh, inoculating your, your beer differently, this changes all the time. Because imagine, every day, it goes through, and then new food arrives, and it has a new, new, new chance to feast and to feed and find, find another balance. So this very quickly changes in a matter of days. Interestingly, they also influ influence your taste. Um, so in three weeks, you're actually adapted to whatever you choose. That's an interesting fact that most people don't know. Um, there's something else that these bacteria would do if we would not be digesting the small chain fatty acids that are meant the acetate, the butyrate, and the propionate. Because um, they might be turned to methane otherwise. And you probably know the experiment with the Lucifer and farting over it. And, getting a flame. Cows are much better at that than, than we are. They can burn down entire f uh, farms, actually. Um, methane is produced by something called the methanobacter. It's ancient. It's from volcanic ages when we had uh, a methane atmosphere. It's really, really old. It's also incredibly sensitive. Getting too cold, getting under 40-ish degrees, under 30, 35-ish degrees, it will die. Um, giving it uh, uh, oxygen, it will die. I mean, it's, it, it came to be in, an, in another kind of atmosphere. And it grows very slowly. And yet, it has survived until now. I'm amazed by that. It can basically only survive in swamps. But have one swamp eat, have one duck eat one swamp, go to another and deposit something there, probably that's the way it passes over. Because it can also survive in the gut. That's why the experiment works. Um, and what it does basically is it takes acetate, remember acetic acid, um, so that will be with the age attached, but take acetate and a hydrogen atom that's been donated by a bacteria that wants to get rid of them, they do exist, 
and then 23H4 and CO2. What? And CO2? We haven't burned it yet, and we have CO2 already. That's a bit early. So what I'm now saying is that when you use this process to produce biogas, because that's what I'm talking about, you are actually producing CO2 before you have your biogas. That's a bit stupid, isn't it? Because when you're doubling the amount of CO2 in this way. Of course, it's quite fine if that CO2 is, a, is an annual cycle, but burning trees, for example, is a very bad idea because we had a CO2 problem before we started digesting trees. My hometown of Enschede, I'm proud to say, is cutting trees like mad, and they're doing the biodigestion, but they're still green because they do it in the waste department where nobody's looking where the CO2 goes. I mean, yeah, waste, everything comes out of there, can be anything. This is really damaging. This is politics having, having a single agenda, just the CO2, and then saying, oh, we want to get away from gas, and then saying, let's ignore that, and let's ignore global heating, and let's just do whatever fits a very small scope. It's terrible. Um, before you can make uh, the meth methanobacter work, you need to do some preparation. You need to get to this acetate. Um, and that's called estogenesis. Before that comes acidogenesis. These are the four stages that um, are done in a, in a bio reactor, uh, in a biodigestion system to, to form uh, methane. And, well, they do all sorts of cut down, but these are basically the three. These are the, this is the formula of the three, the acetate, the butyrate, and the, 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 the propionate, the short-chain fatty acids, as well as alcohols. Well, hydrolysis is what I said, what amylase also does. It cuts up chains of glucose and, or chains like uh, proteins or fats and breaks them into small bundles. So it goes from here to here to here to methano, methanobacter, methanogenesis. Um, the problem is in this stage, because there are side products. One of them is ammonia, NH3. Um, it's a poison to us, basically. Um, it's very aggressive. I mean, look at all those age, ages jumping to get off. Um, but it can also lead to over-fertilization, um, because what you do to process this stuff is you turn it into a nitrous oxide, so NO2, NO3. Um, and um, we have a lot of that already in the ground, which is why when it's hot, weeds are starting to grow like mad and then die off, take out all the oxygen, and we have botulism and we have blue algae problems. That's because of over-fertilization. Um, Somewhat more positive story, hydrogen sulfide, which is a poison again, but it can be easily turned to gypsum by adding uh, water, water damp to it. Hydrogen, of course, can be explosive, but if you are able to split these streams up, you can basically do this. But these are all the extra extras you get when you make uh, biogas. And usually it's burned along with them, and I'm not sure that's a good idea, because that means the nit nitrogen gets into the air as nitrous oxide. That's exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. Also, this introduces a lot of handling overhead, and that means you need to do this on a large scale. And when you do that, you get the same anonymity as you have in the sewer. This can actually be used in a sewer treatise plant. Flush it away, it's gone. No, it's not. The, the travel just starts. The journey just starts. Um, and there have been examples of farmers doing this as an extra thing to get rid of their green waste, for example. But these bacteria must be fed because otherwise they starve. Um, so things like impregnated fence wood might, for example, end up in there. The result is that the output is not completely new, um, natural anymore, but you get heavy metals added. All of a sudden, the end product is waste, is almost nuclear waste. You have to be really careful with it. Same story if you feed it with waste from animal farms. I'm not a fan, fan of animal farms, by the way. Um, I'm the only one here, I'm sure. Um, I'm not a fan of animal farms the way we do it. The strictly economic optimization is a bad idea. Um, because there's toxins in there, there's medicines in there, copper, that sort of thing. You don't want that. So, and on a small scale you can't do this because of the overhead and also because you need to actively heat the biodigestion system. Um, the methanobacter produce the biogas as, as, their energy, as the energy source. And that means you actually need to provide the heat for them um, to stay alive. And this would not be a problem if you wouldn't have to flush through waste all the time. So you're heating up all that waste so that it can do its work. It's uh, a wonderful story. 
So Raf dealt all that with all that. Um, this would also happen in us if it wasn't that we took up these short-chain fatty acids. Um, or you can, of course, eat McChicken, McNuggets all the time, and you probably wouldn't be, you wouldn't have any fibers, so you wouldn't be producing any short-chain fatty acids. Um, microbial fuel cells, however, are another thing that is, are very close to this. And basically what you do then is you say, well, there are these microbes that produce hydrogen. What if I create a condition, oh, create a conditions where I, no, sorry, um, I really need to cut short apparently, I, sorry. Um, microbial fuel cells are like f fuel cells, except you have uh, a cathode and anode that are permissible for microbes and they live on there and they would pass in the hydrogen. That would be very interesting to do that with sludge, but in practice, research has been done. Um, this is not really efficient. If only we had better fuel cells. There may be an option for other hydrogen uh, carriers, and even materials as clay and carbon can be used for that. And this has actually been shown to work with urine. Plain, dull urine. Um, the research that's doing much of that developed this. Actually, this one runs on waste, but it's the same mechanism. These are all microbial fuel cells, very small ones. You build them from clay as a, as a membrane. You have two membranes of carbon, and basically you fill them with sludge uh, from the sewer, because that's microbially, microbially rich, and you train them for a while with, with pee. It sounded to me like they had students coming up and voluntarily peeing, and then... But, um, urea is... 2% of urine, because urine itself is, not, is mostly water. If you get rid of that, then the majority of what's left is called urea. That's this formula. And it carries, a lot of, it carries hydrogen, not specifically much, but it very easily lets go of it. And there are many things in nature that carry electrons and get, get rid of them, but they're usually aggressive. And this one isn't. It's used in skin lotion, for example. And it's very stable when dry. It's used as a nitrogen fertilizer and just stored in bulk in farmer's sheds. Now that's fine, as long as it's dry. Um, you can read up how we get to it, but it's basically a breakdown. Now what I found really interesting was doing some math on the density, energy density of the different materials, both per kilogram, if you have to carry it all the time, or per liter if you have to store it somewhere in your home. And then methane and hydrogen are actually quite low per liter, but of course hydrogen per kilogram has a lot because it's big. Um, but what I found very striking is that even plain urine is better than a lithium-ion battery, both per kilogram and per liter. I have to say, that urine is known for a lot of energy, but many people don't know it. I have to say, this is a theoretic uh, equation, this is theoretically derived from the chemistry, whereas this is what batteries do in practice. So there is a technical percentage here involved. But I think this, this holds a very great promise, and especially if we get rid of the water. In summer, we have lots of heat in our, in our uh, solar boilers anyway, we can't get rid of it. Um, vaporize off the, the water, and then basically you have 50 because it's 2%. You have a 50 times more potent material, both per liter and per kilogram. And 1% is already very interesting there. So um, what, what, what does that mean? We pr produce about 30 grams of urea a day. I suppose it differs whether you eat much meat or, or less or beans. Or, but basically because it's a protein breakdown product. Um, but the liver, um, when you break down protein, you basically produce um, methane, and that's a poison. It's in our bloodstream, and the liver immediately takes it out, and at the expense of energy, it turns it into urea. It really wants to get rid of it. So by the time we pee it out, it has quite a bit of energy. And this is the factor I gave you. This is the amount we pee out. So that's 160 watt hours per day, or 9.7 watts continuously, more than my laptop does, and half of my TV does. Well, I don't have to run my TV full time, so who cares? Um, challenge, anyone interested in building the first Raspberry Pi? I'm not going to, but <laughs> this is sort of the sort of thing we can do, right? Run a server on Pi. Why not? Go for it. So, um, if you allow urea to get watery, as it is in Pi, 
B is uh, when you don't have an uh, infection, a bladder infection, it is basically sterile. But leave it to the air and microbes will get in, discover the energy and make ammonia. And we all know how, how wonderfully that smells. And then to further to turn it down to a fertilizer. If we avoid that process and instead use electrolysis, electrolysis with nickel-ish uh, electrodes, so pretty cheap in co compared to platinum for plain hydrogen winning, you need 37, thank you, um, you need uh, 0.37 volts to use instead of 1.23 volts around your plates, meaning a third of the voltage or a third of the energy to get to the hydrogen. I've heard about blue and black and green uh, hydrogen, but I haven't heard about yellow yet, but I think it's about time we <laughs> get started with that. Um, I have solar cells, I'm sure I'm interested. I um, haven't done all of this yet. Good. Oh, sorry. Um, or you could use a direct urea fuel cell, uh, which basically is a fuel cell that you put urea in, or the microbial version that I just talked about, which you basically infest with sewer water and then train with urine, urine, urine. Um, and that can be done with clay and carbon. This, there's a lot of research being done here um, in the interest of uh, non-industrial uh, poor countries. Um, Unfortunately, the researchers claim a lot of patents. Make, makes me think of RSA. I don't think we want to do that again. So go around, go and play with it. Try it. The recipes are basically in the research papers. Play with it and see if you can, you can do it too. And score by uh, publishing patent avoidance or patent, patent prevention things. Now, I, my home and the thousand around me in my, in my uh, hometown um, are connected to a heating system, a central heating system for the entire thousand homes. It's incredibly efficient, inefficient. It's more than 50 years old. Um, it predates the Club of Rome. And we are forced to use it. So I said, I don't like it. I don't want it because it's all fossil. I want to get rid of it. And also because of the, the waste uh, treatment, the biogas greenwashing. So I said, I want, to, I want to get out of it. They said, you can't. We can't disconnect you. So I said, well, my, my neighboring plumber says I can. He can do it. So it can be done. So it's technically not a problem. It's just because there's lack of will on your side. And then I just looked up the uh, legal, uh, the legal si situation and <laughs> they've made so many mistakes in legal terms. They've broken so many consumer laws and so many heating, there's a special farm to that, especially heating, heating law in the Netherlands. They've broken so much of it that I just said, well, you've done that, that, that wrong. Um, we could go to court, but you know, I can just destroy the contract because you've done bedrog, bedrog and misdrag van omstandigheden, which are reasons to destroy a contract, meaning the contract never existed. So I am now um, not connected to that anymore. I used infrared panels fed with my solar panels covered by 90% by the solar, uh, solar panels. But I'm very interested now in opportunistic ways of avoiding using this infrared. And because of that, I've looked at compost for heating. People have done this. People have just built a compost pile inside there. They build a structure, put a compost pile in, um, and they basically used it for heat. Um, you need to be aware that it needs to have oxygen. It needs to get out its CO2. So you need to be careful a little. But there are a few very good, re very simple reasons for making this go stably, because compost is extremely stable. Also, it's even, no, I, won't, I won't cover that today, but we can even benefit from recycling phosphor that way. Um, this is basically how composting goes. That's the first, a second, and third phase. They usually occur in order, um, but the temperature changes. It starts off around 40-ish degrees Celsius. If you're American, you need to look on the other side. Um, um, and then it can go up to 70. Um, there are bacteria that really like to be there, the thermolytic bacteria. They're, yeah, some of them, they all have their own niche, and some of them like to be hot. But there are also cooler versions, so you can also do the, the process here. That process happens in a few weeks. This one takes a few months. So if you're looking into heating your home over winter, this is the option until the winter becomes so small that, well, that will be different. Um, so how much energy can we get from there? Well, a kilogram of plant waste, uh, calculation, 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 a kilogram of plant waste is about 1.2 kilowatt hours. Uh, check it, for, please, before, before you take it. But I've basically assumed that our body is, uh, is doing its best to, 
to do the same process because it's quite likely over that this is oxygenated. But um, basically, you have about 1.2 kilowatt hours. And I've seen people building showers that they use over summer with, with uh, compost, getting these high temperatures, of course, and they did like 500 showers in a cubic meter. So that just about fits. Um, a single shower will be 3 kilowatt hours, 20 minutes with a, a, chi uh, a saving uh, cap, and would need 2.5 kilograms of plant waste. You produce about half a kilogram a day, by the way. So that's not a complete solution, but it's interesting. Now, there are a few, few rules. Um, you want to avoid rotting ammonia rodents. It's pretty easy. I mean, any gardener can do it. It's really quite trivial. But you need to get, get, get some trust in yourself to do that. But there are three factors by which you can control the speed by which the process happens. You, you lower the time that I have left all the time. Can't you, can't you make it go up? Can't you collaborate here? Come on. Oh well, um, there are three factors of thank you. There are three factors of speed control. Um, moist being one, um, the amount of heat that goes out. I mean, if you don't want the 70 degrees, just take out enough heat so that it drops to to 40, of course. Um, and basically, you could uh, <laughs> have a pro thermostat uh, that is very slowly responding influencing these things. Um, what gardeners also do is they turn the pile inside out. You could figure out some screw or something, that uh, Archimedes screw or something that does that. That's a bit fantastic. Okay, practice. This is what I, what I made. Uh, I spent eight euros worth of money. I really invested big time. Um, I, ha I had a large bag. I filled it with I had a large bag, I filled it with uh, leaves. Le leaf litter is just about the easiest to compost anyway, because it just takes the microbes. Just add a spoonful of ground, and it's thr tri it's, it thrives with bacteria. It will happily chew away at that. So this is about half cubic meter, uh, half a meter thickness I, I aim for. I added a good layer of insulation, so that basically I have, when it gets hot uh, near the insulation, it just reflects back. So it's not like getting rid of the heat, so it can actually get hot. Um, unfortunately, what I did wrong is um, it belched out. So I had a really thick piece here that burned really fast. So in a short time, I had a pretty hot, warm home. So I know to, to be a better constructor, but I also know I'm not very good at that. So maybe you should get help, whatever. Um, but this is underneath a, a concrete staircase in my home. It's central, while the sides are usually warm. There are actual rooms, and there's just a hallway. And that hallway tends to be chilly in the winter. And this actually helped to make it more comfortable. That's just opportunistic, just avoiding that heat can escape, but um, it really worked well. And of course, this is a room with, there was some floor ventilation. It's, it's the, the garage and it has some floor ventilation, so any CO2 would easily get out, and that did indeed work. So um, big lesson was a lot of fun, and there are a few concrete lessons as well. Now, very important is that Nature's pretty much figured out all the recipes it needs. So all the microbes that we need are pretty much around us. And they will find the, the spots to work in. If we change niches, if we find new niches, niches to work in, we are in trouble because then nature starts inventing new solutions. And microbes reproduce very fast, so they will very quickly adapt their genome, and very quickly form new species. If you play around with beer, that's not a problem. That's a known recipe. But if you do things like heating up the climate or having poor hygiene um, where animals suddenly or people suddenly get in touch with poo, for example, or with uh, dead bodies or, or, or those difficult things, or when um, animals get enclosed, like uh, uh, rabbits used to get myxomatosa when they get, they multiply very easily and when they get too close they form myxomatosa and basically contaminate each other and massively die out. That's a useful regulation mechanism, um, but it uses basically these mechanisms. Um, if you take this to the extreme, you're basically doing biologic weapon development, research and development. Strictly forbidden in just about any decent country. Um, in this case, even the Netherlands is pretty decent. But somehow, animal farming does exactly those things. It has sick animals locked up in cages, too near to each other, can't move out of the way when, uh, when it gets too hot. Um, we are actually causing 
uh, mutations of microbes, together with climate change, it's even worse. I can only think of one difference between these two. This one is strictly hygienic in a laboratory, and this one is open in the plane next to you. That really worries me. I've talked to Mark Rutte about this, I've, our, our prime, prime Minister, I've, ri I've written him a long letter. Um, of course, got no response. I mean, there's probably no money to be made or something. Um, or it was too difficult, all these letters. Um, it didn't fit in his Nokia, I'm sure. That must have been it. Um, uh, I asked the responsible government department, LMV, in our country, um, how do they protect us against mut mutilations? Uh, what's the R that we can expect? What's the risk of it passing over to humans? Uh, what would then the R factor be? They don't have an idea. There are a few brands like the monkey pox, they probably saw that coming. That the, the, the ones that they know from other countries, they know about, and they try to monitor, and they have a monitoring signaling system. Basically, they start flapping around like headless chicken to try and contain the problem, which is definitely not uh, 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 guaranteed if it's going to be a flu-like virus, because they're extremely contagious for us. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. I d I'm not saying we should stop animal farming. I, should, I, think, I, I think we should start animal, fi uh, blah, 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 animal farming again, but do it so that animals are healthy and full of life. And whatever it takes to do that is what you need to do, I think. That's basically what I told Mark Rutte, but then again, fifty day. Um, whole plant, yeah, well, um, basically I've covered all of this. Most important thing, there are a few angles where you can play. You can make, build a comp controller um, for your compost, you can play with that. I haven't done that yet, I'm definitely going to. Um, and publish it, please, share the knowledge. Um, because if I get something working, then I have a thousand similar homes that can do the same. They're also very intrigued about getting rid of this incredibly poor heating network anyway. Um, and document it, please, so that nobody can get patents about it. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much, and maybe there are questions. We do have some time left, so if there are questions, please line up at the microphones in the middle of the room, and feel free to ask. <coughs> yes, he said, I should haste him so that you could ask questions. <coughs> Anyone? Yes. Microphone in the front, please. It's a very unknown area. That's probably why people are a bit... Um, they need to um, think. You were talking yeah. quite fast, but it was really sorry, interesting. Sorry? They need to think. You were talking quite fast, but it was really interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's many sci or, uh, chemistry talks here. But um, you said that the um, energy for the urine and urea was um, like purely <laughs> theoretical. Um, yeah. If there, have there been any realistic like attempts at extracting that energy, and do we know like what percentage of the theoretical that has reached yet? Um, y yes. This machine ran not on urine, by the way, but on flies and such as scraps it found around, um, but on organic waste for seven days um, with 48 of, the, of these things, and you can see it has two volts apparently. Um, because those meters have faults over there, I believe. Um, um, and it's been autonomous for, for a week. It's basically done, it, done its task. Um, there are small-scale setups. Um, you can definitely burn a lead on it. That's easy. And there's more to be had. But that basically, lead is already a bit of power, right, compared to a microcontroller. I think you could run a microcontroller on it. Um, it depends very much, because um, not all these will have the same output, um, and they're like uneven batteries, and you know what happens then. One starts charging the other, it's, it gets out of balance. One of the things we might do to improve this, we as a community, I mean, um, helping out these researchers, is to find ways of switching voltage or something, or pile them up su such that we don't get the, the, the loss of energy from that. Um, there are many things that need to be researched. Basically, it's a tinkering area, and the interesting thing is there are I think there are less than 10 researchers working on this. 
Um, so it's <laughs> we can expand extra incredibly on this, and it has a huge problem uh, potential. Okay, thank you. Okay, yep. microphone in the back, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, if I'm if I'm lawn mowing, so if I'm mowing grass and put that all on a big pile, it, it gets so hot, I fear it will ignite. So yep. could you say what process that is, and could we use that? That is the composting process. Okay. And yes, you could use that, although I don't know how fast your grass grows. Um, but yeah, that's exactly, that's probably 70 degrees. You could measure it. Uh, measure the inside, of course, because the outside is going to be colder. But yeah, um, vapor tends to come off as well because uh, CH constructions are turned into CO2 in H2O, so you will see steam escaping as well. So you might even cycle that back or retain it or use that for energy. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I'm talking about when I'm saying compost can be a heating source. Okay, yep. thanks. Okay, yep. and microphone. Um, in, in general, when you take plant waste, you put it in a pile, it's going to turn into compost. That's almost always what always happens, provided there's oxygen. If there's no oxygen, it's going to rot, and you are going to notice. Okay, uh, yep. I'm going to try that. Okay, microphone in the back, please, again. <coughs> Your front. Hello, this is... Hey. Um, I have a question about the um, the bio uh, gas is uh, I believe what it's called um, where you take rotten uh, fruit and vegetables and stuff. Oh yeah, biogas. You create biogas. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that it creates uh, this gas and CO2. Yeah. But isn't the CO2 already in the um, yes. the, the the bio waste and will will it be released anyway? Um, yes, it would also be released in a composting process, yes. Um, what I'm saying is this is an extra warning that you need to look, not just the CH4, but also CO2 is a double warning that you should really look where it comes from. Um, make sure that it's something that will indeed bind back again next year and not burn down or break down trees or trunks or, or branches or whatever. These have been around for very long. Um, they probably don't grow anymore, but uh -huh. we had a CO2 problem before we started cutting down trees yeah, yeah. for CO2, like Enschede is doing. Terrible city to live in sometimes. So, so maybe ma only make uh, biogas from things that are already dead, like, um, like banana, sh banana sh peel shells. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if it's dead, but yeah. Okay. Basically, right. when it wants to decompose, when it can't retain its intact structure, and that's what you could call that. Right. Thanks. Yes. Microphone in front, please. I am not actually that familiar with composting myself, but I'm very curious. Are there any uh, any waste products that you need to worry about when composting? No. Because uh, it, uh, the composting would also produce CO2 and possibly methane, right? Yes. Usually, you do composting with stuff you have in your kitchen. You don't want to add boiled foods, you don't want to add cheese or meat or that because that would attract rodents. You might like them, I, most people don't. Um, but bacterially, no. And if you're any bit afraid, you wash, wash your hands with soap afterwards. Yeah, it, this is more about uh, when you do it indoor, uh, the gases yeah. that come yeah. off it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's what I said. When you do this indoors, you need to have an exhaust for the CO2. And that's why I said in my garage on the bottom, where CO2 lands usually, there's uh, ventilation. Yes. Thank you. Yep. And microphone in the back, please. Um, uh, you said uh, you asked us if we could doc document our findings. And I was wondering, do you have any pointers for that? Like, what should we document? Where should we document it? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 of course. TD Commons is what I usually do. Um, they're started by Google, but they are run by publisher. I don't know which one anymore, but there's some lo long-term arrangement so that it will work quite well. Um, TD Commons is the name. It's in one of the footnotes. Here it is. And basically, you print a PDF, you upload it, it takes two or three weeks. Of course, you don't need to do this just for this. Um, this is just a general, if you want to avoid patents, use it. Please do. When I think of new ideas with solar boilers, for example, I first write it there and then I talk to someone about it. But I don't want this sustainable technology to be patented because it should be everyone's. It should be for the people, not for the companies. And do you have any suggestion what specifically we should document? What parts, like... Oh, um, any, 
if you play around with this, you discover something like this material, or um, like if I put a thread in it, or if I use, um, they've, they've done things like using um, um, active car coil, which, which a car co active car coil, yeah, yeah. which has very high surface area. They've stuck that in a particular way on a carbon sheet and used that as an, as an electrode so that many uh, bacteria could, uh, could uh, attach, for example. Now, those things are wonderful, but I'm not sure that one is patented or not, but that's the sort of thing you don't want to think about, right? Um, I, I said this shouldn't be uh, sustainable technology, shouldn't be for companies. What I actually mean is not for a single company. We don't want monopolies. Okay, and the last question from yeah. the microphone in the front, please. Uh, yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts are on uh, genetic engineering, for example, uh, cyan uh, yeah, cyanobacteria to be able to uh, take sunlight and CO2 and uh, produce uh, I think it's scary. Use. Because it's an expensive process, and it means it can only be done by companies like Monsanto, who have a lot of money to spend and who basically want to sell their, um, um, ah, how, how do you call it? Um, they've got this terrible poison that kills just about all life. Roundup, thank you. Yes. Um, um, and basically, they genetically engineer things so that they're um, compatible. And this is spreading. And since they have a patent, they're actually f filing charges against farmers in neighboring fields who happen to have picked up this because they naturally recycle the seeds. Uh, uh, I'm do not you, a big fan. Do you I also think it's dangerous. But those are maybe, I, I think in every technology you can have, you can use it for good or you yeah. can do it, use it for bad things. Yeah. But there are also, for example, iGEM teams that really um, get into uh, also genetically engineering organisms, but to create uh, uh, some uh, application that we can use. And um, yeah, is, don't you think that that could also provide for a solution sometimes, <sighs> instead of just being evil? Um, because I sometimes do used. agree, if you've been here during the previous lecture, he said we have a great religious belief in technology, but usually solves one problem and creates five others. Um, we are pretty good at abstracting and looking at one section of a problem only and solving that. And that's also the mindset behind genetic engineering. So I am incredibly cautious. So I, I'm not saying black or white, I'm saying dark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you all for the questions. Then you will be open for questions outside if there are more? Oh yeah. Okay, perfect. Then thank you very much for this really interesting talk.